The U.S. calls for an end to the war in Yemen and urges both sides to agree to a ceasefire in the next 30 days. But with the fighting into its fourth year, many failed peace efforts, as well as famine and humanitarian disaster, will this time be any different? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. Enough is enough is the message from the United States to the warring parties in Yemen. The Americans want a halt to the more than three years of combat between Houthi rebels and the Saudi and UAE-led coalition supporting Yemeni government troops. The U.S. Defense Secretary is calling for a ceasefire by the end of the month. The United Nations is welcoming the U.S. appeal to replace combat with compromise. But the American message to Saudi and Emirati allies could fall on deaf ears. Thousands of reinforcements have been sent this week to the rebel hill city of Hudayda. It is the major port for the massive amounts of food and aid needed to keep millions of Yemenis from starving to death. The special envoy will continue to work with all parties to agree on tangible steps to spare all Yemenis the disastrous consequences of further conflict and to urgently address the political, security and humanitarian crisis in Yemen. He urges all concerned parties to seize this opportunity to engage constructively with the current efforts to swiftly resume political consultations to agree on a framework for political negotiations and confidence building measures. In particular, enhancing the capacities of the Central Bank of Yemen, the exchange of prisoners, and the reopening of Sana'a Airport. Stopping the war and the acts of aggression from aggressor states supported by the U.S. is necessary. We currently are not acting as aggressors against any of our neighbour states. They are doing so against us. And so when the war stops and the aggression against us stops, we will be for a peace which will preserve our independence and protect our independent entity from any interference from any other state, whether they're neighbouring or not. Let's introduce the panel now in Washington, D.C., Eric Eikenberry, an advocacy associate at Yemen Peace Project, and Sana Hassan Abogadi, a Yemen affairs specialist, finally also in Washington, D.C., Sigurd Neubauer, a Middle East specialist. Welcome to all of you. Um, I will start with you, Eric. Um, a State Department spokesperson says that this call for this ceasefire is in no way related to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, the timing. Do you agree with that? Do you believe that? Not entirely. I think in the aftermath of the Khashoggi murder, we've seen a lot of congressional reaction. We've seen a lot of very strong pushback from within the U.S. government. But what's been interesting about this pushback is how quickly it has pivoted to Yemen and to U.S. involvement in Yemen. And I think that reflects not only outrage over the murder of Khashoggi, which was a terrible event, an individual tragedy, um, but knowledge from members of Congress, knowledge from certain corners of the administration that U.S. support for the side led coalition in Yemen is vital, and that if you want to roll back Saudi behavior, whether it be, or Emirati behavior as well, whether it be in Yemen or elsewhere, you need to start looking very critically at this support. Um, so I think the two um, policymakers are very willing to connect these two issues. Sigurd, so what do you make of the timing? I would uh, add that it, uh, the United States government, uh, really from Secretary Mattis um, to Secretary uh, Pompeo, have consistently called for the resumption of UN peace talks um, at least for the last year and a half. But each time the United States has, has demanded uh, concrete steps, it has fallen on deaf ears in Abu Dhabi and in Riyadh. So the difference now is that the United States does believe that it has some leverage um, over the two parties into this conflict uh, precisely because of the fallout over the Khashoggi affair. So um, this is directly attributed to trying to reverse a negative trend in the U.S.-Saudi uh, uh, relationship over Yemen. So even be before the leverage, yes, there have periodically been times that the U.S. Has, has drawn some sort of attention to the conflict in Yemen. But just asking for it isn't the same as really having any force behind it or having any will to make it done or even um, withdrawing from the role that, that they actually played in it. Do you think the U.S. has ever had the will to do something about this, Sigurd? The United States has always had the will. The problem that we have seen in the 
U.S.-Saudi relationship over the past uh, 18 to 20 months is that unless President Trump makes a deliberate statement, um, uh, statements uh, by his subordinates, uh, namely the cabinet secretaries of defense and state, have been ignored altogether. And we have also seen that on a bureaucratic level, the U.S. government has uh, repeatedly called for an end of hostility and resumption of peace talks. Um, what What is different now is that uh, the uh, uh, culmination of events, whether it's a Khashoggi affair, whether it is the broader instability in the Middle East, and now the Washington Post playing a uh, central role in demanding justice for Jamal Khashoggi um, and tying it to broader U.S.-Saudi uh, uh, cooperation in the region is drawing um, tremendous scrutiny uh, domestically here in the United States. And it is leaving the administration with little choice but to opt uh, up the pressure on Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, even though, and I will add, that the relationship uh, between the United States and Saudi Arabia is strategic, including on, on Yemen. So this is an extraordinary difficult balancing act that the president has to engage in right now. Um, Hussein, what do you make of the timing now that there seems to be more of a, a public push to, to draw attention to what has been happening in Yemen for years, more than 10,000 civilians killed? Uh, yeah, I think the United States with this uh, kind of statement, they want now to withdraw uh, the attention uh, of uh, the killing of uh, Khashoggi uh, to, and like to withdraw it into Yemen. It's not to show what's happening in Yemen, it's just to show that the United States is willing uh, to bring peace uh, into Yemen. Uh, and we all know, and as Trump has said many times, that the Saudi cannot stay for two weeks without U.S. support. Uh, so I think if the United States really wanted to stop uh, the war, they can stop it uh, in a matter of, uh, of days. Uh, and uh, actually, we must look into the statement, uh, what uh, the statement has have talked uh, about uh, a ceasefire. And if you look into it, uh, it is only a ceasefire from uh, the Houthi. The statement has requested uh, uh, Houthi first to stop uh, their missiles against Saudi Arabia, to stop their drone strike against Saudi Arabia and as well United Arab uh, Emirates. And in return, uh, the Saudi Red Coalition will stop uh, striking uh, highly populated area. Uh, this means that the Saudi Saudi can bomb any uh, rural area, they can bomb road, uh, anything that's out a, a major city like Sana'a and Hudayda. And I think uh, this kind of ceasefire is just only to protect the Saudi and they so want Hussein, to make me... uh, the war just to stay in Yemen. They do want it. Let me, so let me ask you that. When you, So you're saying that th you don't think that this call for a ceasefire is even handed. Does that mean you don't think it's genuine either? Um, it, it is not uh, a ceasefire, and uh, and I think that, uh, as I said, the United, the United States uh, is is the one who is back in uh, this war, uh, and they can stop it as soon uh, as they want. But we know that the uh, United States have struck uh, billions of dollars in deals with the Saudi area. Some of the largest uh, deals uh, in, in in U.S. history has been do during. Uh, this war uh, and and all that uh, it just uh, uh, doesn't matter to Yemenis because the first thing that the United States actually can do and the United Nations uh, to Yemeni is to lift the blockade or at least uh, to leave uh, humanitarian aid and supplies and fuel to come into Yemen freely and then they can talk uh, about peace. Eric, do you agree with what Hussein is saying that if the United States had wanted to do something about this sooner? They could have. I mean, they are they are supplying, um, obviously, a lot of the weapons, some logistical support as well. And horrific things continue to happen there, particularly to civilians. Yeah, um, I mean, he's right in the sense that the United States has extraordinary leverage in terms of refueling, logistical support, munition sales, um, and also targeting assistance as well. And the administration has been very reluctant and resistant to exercising some of this leverage. And one of the very disappointing things about the Pompeo and Mattis statements is that even though they advanced um, the strongest rhetoric yet on the conflict and the 30-day deadline for ending it and bringing everyone to the table, uh, it was still rhetoric. There was no sort of threat attached to that. There was no actual push or leverage. Um, the United States can certainly stop or be, play a role in stopping the worst of the violence, um, particularly uh, stopping um, airstrikes that are targeting civilians in rural and urban areas and that are destroying so much economic infrastructure. Um, the United States can't wave a magic wand and bring the parties automatically to a table that will, that will produce a long-lasting accord. That has to come from the Yemeni parties themselves. And even though 
um, Pompeo's statement on the sequencing, I believe, deserves some criticism. As Hussein pointed out, um, the sequencing for um, reducing ballistic missile fire and reducing airstrikes should be simultaneous. The Houthis also do have a responsibility to stop that ballistic missile fire, which is justifying the United States is using, using that to justify continued hostilities. So it's on all the warring parties to stop this here, although the United States does play an outsized role. So, um, Eric, um, about that, yes, there, there are calls for a ceasefire, sure, but have you, I'm sorry, Sigurd, pardon me, Eric, I want this question to go to Sigurd. Um, have you seen or heard any actual solutions to the situation in Yemen? Obviously, the ceasefire matters because people are dying, clearly. But beyond that, it's one thing to call for, to call for, a, call for a ceasefire. Have you seen anything out there in the public discussion that's an actual potential solution to what is happening there? I'm, I'm very glad that you asked that question because it's really important to understand for our viewers that uh, U.S. diplomats remain uh, in regular contact with the Houthi leadership, um, which is based in Oman. And part of the Houthi delegation that would negotiate in peace talks are based in Muscat, Oman, with the precise goal that they will be able to travel to the peace talks once they um, eventually take place. The Houthi spokesman, Mohammed Abdul Salim, is uh, based in Muscat, and he's quite a moderate figure, I would add, and he uh, maintains regular contacts with uh, U.S. diplomats. So the Americans understand, have a better understanding of what the Houthis want, what a roadmap um, towards a de-escalation and eventually peace talks uh, can take place. And what I, where I will disagree with the two other panelists is that the United States is, um, on one hand, sending messages uh, throughout uh, the public sphere by uh, uh, by issuing statements, and in private, we are seeing quite some arm twisting taking place. So just because there are no public threats from uh, the Trump administration against Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates um, against uh, uh, procedural matters that they could implement if peace talks are not um, proceeding, the fact that we have a 30-day uh, timeline for peace talks to resume is, is in a significant statement in itself. He's saying, tell us more about what is happening in Hudaydah or what you anticipate happening there. Um, at this uh, moment, uh, the Saudi -like coalition is gathering tens of thousands uh, of fighters, uh, sending send new uh, armored vehicles uh, south of Hudaydah. So they are preparing uh, for a major attack uh, on Hudaydah. And I think uh, this could be the biggest attack uh, that will be conducted in Hudaydah. Uh, and at the same time, we see the statement about peace. Uh, in Yemen, in the last four years, uh, every time someone, either from the United Nations or UK or US, uh, come uh, and release a statement uh, about peace in Yemen and talks and ceasefire, we see a major attack uh, that will take place uh, straight after. Uh, the invasion of Aden, uh, it came uh, during uh, a ceasefire. Uh, uh, the attacks on some uh, areas on uh, uh, the, the border of Yemen was during the ceasefire. The when they talk uh, Mocha, uh, port. It was during uh, this type of uh, statement. So it's all uh, cover up. And we will see uh, that in, in the coming days, when the Saudi-led coalition war will uh, start attacking Hudaydah, then we're going to see the United Nations uh, will ask again and talk uh, to all the sides to cease fire just to uh, to keep the Saudi-led coalition uh, okay, safe in this area that they have uh, controlled. Okay, Hussein, just a moment, because I want to bring Eric into this. Eric, um, Hussein has repeatedly brought up the UN, and that's a really good point. What, what role um, should or could the UN have played along the way here? What role can they play now? I mean, now I think the UN can help mediate a peace process between the parties. Maybe not an immediate peace process. The UN Special Envoy Martin Griffiths talks about stopping the fighting first and building peace later. Um, and I think the contact he's maintaining with both Ansar Allah and the Houthis and also Saudi Arabia coalition and also the United States is very important to stopping the worst of the violence, to stopping the missile strikes on both sides, um, to potentially averting uh, an escalation in Hadeda. Uh, Martin Griffiths was instrumental in the, over the course of the summer. Um, when a lot of UN pressure and a lot of international pressure from humanitarians um, stopped a direct assault on the port. And now we do see new sources massing. And given the significance for the humanitarian situation, that is extraordinarily um, concerning. Uh, the United Nations cannot solve all problems. The United Nations cannot 
you know, create a peace process from the ground up. At best, it's a venue to bring parties together and to get people in conversation. We should be looking at the armed actors themselves to take on responsibilities they have under international humanitarian law, international human rights law. We should be looking to Yemeni civil society as well and Yemeni women as well to include them in the peace process, to buttress the peace process moving forward. Um, the UN is a venue. It's not an actor that can create things and move things by itself. Okay, fair enough. Um, Sir Gord, how much credibility does the kingdom have now that obviously they, they very publicly have been lying about what, and their story has changed publicly. That's, that's not up for debate about what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. So having said that, on the international stage, how much credibility do they actually have now going forward, whether it's a peace process, whether it's, it's talks? I mean, they have been allowed to investigate themselves when it comes to to killing civilians. How much credibility does the Saudi still have on the international stage now? I would put it slightly differently, and I would I would add that just the return um, of uh, Prince Ahmed, the uh, younger brother of King Salman, from his self-imposed exile um, in London to his return to Riyadh the other day underscores how uh, severe the uh, uh, crisis uh, surrounding uh, Saudi Arabia standing in the world and in, within the international community is. The Saudi royal family are now uh, gathering. We, of course, uh, don't quite know what kind of conversations are taking place, but they fully understand um, that uh, the present trajectory of Saudi Arabia's role in the region and in which the United States is unattainable. So that's the first part. Going back to the issue of Hudaydah, the United States has repeatedly um, declared, uh, both publicly and privately, that it will not tolerate any uh, capturing of that Red Sea port because it would essentially block an, all um, entries of humanitarian supplies to Yemen's population. So um, the United States will not tolerate it now, and it has not tolerated it in the past, even though we're seeing as uh, Hussein suggests, some um, efforts to uh, consolidate control on the ground level around the area. But, but uh, if the Saudis and Emiratis would attempt to, re, uh, to capture that city, I think that all hell will be, uh, would break loose. So, Gord, let me, let me they, if you... They're not quite going to do that. Just a moment. I'm going to let Eric get in there because I, I could tell Eric seemed a, a bit skeptical. If I'm not going to put words in your mouth as to what you were saying. Eric, go ahead. No, I think the United States has technically drawn a red line around the port, don't attack the port. But the United States has given Saudis and Emiratis de facto permission to do all kinds of things around Hadeda, all kinds of things on the West Coast, all types of violence that are significantly exacerbating the humanitarian situation. The United States could have exercised this leverage to stop this offensive before it ever really got going and stop the, what Oxfam, I think, recorded in September is the 470,000 that have been displaced. Um, the United States has also, and this was said publicly by State Department officials at the Middle East Institute not too long, the United States is also fine with the Emiratis and the Saudis sort of uh, exercising military leverage in Hadeda um, to push the Houthis to a political solution. Um, now, whether that will work is significantly up in the air, but it's undoubted that there's going to be significant civilian penalties for that and costs to civilians. So I don't think the United States' red line around Hadeda has really held, and I don't think the United States really um, has acted properly or really done all it could to stave off a humanitarian crisis there. Hussein, go ahead. Yeah, I don't think there is a, a United States red line around Hudaydah. Because if there was, then why the Saudi-led coalition has been attempting uh, for the last uh, three months uh, to enter Hudaydah? Uh, the United States is fully backing the, the Saudi-led coalition war effort in Yemen. It doesn't matter in Hudaydah or at the border or in Aden. It's everywhere. They just want to keep helping the Saudi to push uh, uh, into Hudaydah and any other uh, area. And if the United States and the United Nations actually want to help Yemen before talking about ceasefire, they have at least to lift uh, the blockade or to let food and medicine and fuel uh, come into Yemen, because this is what Yemeni want. It's not about what the Houthi want, what the Hadi want, or what others. What Yemeni urgently now need is they need medical help, uh, urgent food supplies, and this is blocked by the Saudi-led coalition. Closing airport and port is, is a war crime. Uh, so this is the first step, I think, to bring uh, peace into Yemen, and the United States must 
actually uh, uh, um, say the name the, the Saudi in any statement because what I mean the United Nations and US uh, call what happened in Yemen is a conflict Yemeni conflict or a civil war in Yemen is not like that if you do mention the Saudi role in Yemen this means that you are giving them a green a green light to do whatever they, uh, they want okay. in our country okay so there are obviously members of the US Congress um, from both parties some who have been critical of Saudi for years and even more so now um, because of what has happened to Jamal Khashoggi. Do those members of Congress have leverage to get the Trump administration to do something? Well, the broader point here is I think that um, the kind of lobbying efforts um, that have been taking place in the past and the rhetoric that uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates are the um, bulk war against Iran are ring is ringing hollow at the moment precisely because of the Khashoggi affair. So what, what has happened is that the appetite in Washington and the mood has changed. Um, it is clearly that the war in Yemen now is uh, uh, gaining renewed attention and the question marks are being erased over what kind of partnerships uh, the U.S.-Saudi partnership, what kind of results that partnership is producing in Yemen. I think that the next uh, phase of the debate is going to focus on U.S.-Iran talks and how that could factor in in Yemen. Obviously, um, the relationship between Washington and Riyadh is strategic, and the United States understands that Saudi Arabia has legitimate uh, security concerns. Having said that, the uh, status quo of the war uh, has not been um, sustainable for, for quite some time. So I think that the wrapped up pressure that we're seeing uh, from the administration combined um, with, uh, with rhetoric coming out of the Congress, including from both parties, and the U.S. media is, uh, is uh, producing unprecedented uh, pressure on the Saudis and Emiratis, and that, that message has not gone lost in either uh, capital. So right now, the United States needs to continue to push forward um, to ensure that peace talks um, can take place rather sooner than later. Eric, do you see this as a moment that there could be a, a, a reevaluation of the chain of the relationship between Saudi Arabia and and the U.S. and and perhaps as a result, something actually will change in Yemen. Um, yes, but just to briefly respond to some panelists' points, um, I do very strongly and want to continue strongly condemning. Um, the Emirati-led campaign in the West Coast that is causing so much displacement. But also, the Houthis bear a lot of responsibility for civilian suffering in terms of laying landmine, in terms of destroying transportation networks, in terms of conscripting people into armed service. And that should also be pointed out and condemned. Sure. sure. Um, about the congressional picture, I think we are approaching a bit of an inflection point, not with this administration's relationship with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. They seem to be all in, but with Congress's relationship with Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. I think um, Sigur was right that Congress is no longer looking at Saudi Arabia and the Emirates as reliable security partners. Um, we have two bills going on right now, um, uh, House Concurrent Resolution 138 and Senate Joint Resolution 54 that will be coming up after the election. Each is a war powers resolution that invokes congressional war authorities, little use congressional war authorities, to uh, withdraw U.S. logistical and personnel support to the Saudi-led coalition's bombing campaign in Yemen. Um, if those got high vote counts or if those passed, and I think in the Senate side in particular, there's a very strong chance that it passes, that would represent a historic rebuke. And even if it doesn't become law in the lame duck, um, the further the Saudis and Emiratis push this, the more they are poisoning their long-term position within the U.S. government, and the more future administrations are going to look at them askance, regardless of what the present administration does. Who's saying we're about out of time, but I'm going to let you have um, the last word uh, fairly quickly. When we circle back and talk to you again in 30 days, do you think that anything would have changed, even a little? Uh, no, I don't think that anything uh, will change because the U.S. Uh, and Saudi relationship is based on money. And this was clearly uh, in uh, Trump uh, mid-election campaign. He has spoken about money many, many times. Uh, so as long as the Saudi is, is actually given money to the United States, uh, nothing will change. And I think the only thing that will change this war, if the Houthi and Yemeni blast, b b uh, ballistic missile, if they targeted Saudi oil field and Saudi main uh, economy backbone, then I think this will actually hurt the United States and they might actually try to stop this war.
Okay, hopefully there will be a, a ceasefire. That, that's what I think everybody can hope for that. And, and thank you all for joining me. I appreciate it very much. Um, Eric Eikenberry, Hussein al Bugatti, and Sigur Nobauer. And thank you for watching us. You can see the program again anytime. If you go to our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team. Bye for now.